the sucker. If you tell that scalp, you promise keep the ticket. I, 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 I told him, man, I would go. I told God, I would go to jail with you. And a lawyer was standing right there giving me wise counsel. So, the Lord really worked that was tremendous. An incredible experience. And we're grateful to the Lord. Uh, the Brother Ben, Brother Ben just forced us to charge his bus. And it really was a blessing. We had a charge bus and had plenty of room and great accommodations. We were kind of teasing about the fact that it was some uh, Hilton Gardens motel. So we thought there was going to be like three three levels and four and a budget eight. But uh, as it turned out, we found accommodation. We had a great time. And, uh, brother Keith Tyler, Brother Jason G, and Brother Ben did just a tremendous job in organizing the event and planning. It was just, just a tremendous experience. And it was just it was great to have uh, little Brother Tyler, uh, uh, Tyler, Tyler, I'm sorry, Brother Tyler. Oh, he was with us and he served us. Yeah. He treated us like royals and he served us and so like that on the side of class. <laughs> and he served us. He served us pretzels and potato chips and Cheetos and peanuts. Everybody's blessed all with about 200 points. <laughs> but it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. And uh, Brother Keith and I were sitting there the first night. And Brother Keith just caught me and said, we got some good men. All the men was in front of us, and we were sitting behind them. He was kind of going down the road of all the men. He said, how blessed we are to great Bible church and have such good men, a men of God who really want to grow in faith. And we thank God for that. Amen. Give the Lord a praise off. <laughs> so there's some of the brothers who were unable to make this trip with them. Coming back, Brother Keith and I were talking. We're going to plan sort of a mini promise keeper. We're going to have our own promise keeper battle, as he put it. <laughs> he really wasn't scouting the tickets. <laughs> he wanted to, though. <laughs> One of the quick notes uh, next Sunday. Lord willing, if the weather permits, we've been having our annual falls summer picnic. <laughs> and so we're scared. we're going to eat next Sunday somewhere. If the weather permits, we're going to eat at Shawnee Park, which is our traditional place. And uh, Brother Ed Hill and the company are making everything ready. And we have a great feast there. And if the weather is inclement, then we'll just set the big grill up out in the back. And we'll roast chicken and hot dogs and hamburgers and whatever else they bring. And we'll just have a great time. So. Uh, uh, next Sunday, we do plan to have our uh, uh, annual summer fall feast, and so we hope that you'll plan to be with us, and uh, we'll plan to go to meet the following church. So if you want to bring a change of clothing here, you're welcome to do that, but the men will leave early to make sure that everything is made ready, and everyone here is invited to come. It's a great time to be together, and just have a great time of fellowship, and, uh, and food, and a lot of frivolity, so we plan to be with us next week. If you have your Bibles handy, I want to invite your attention this morning to the 16th chapter of the Gospel of John. John chapter 16. Stand with me for public reading of the word. John chapter 16, look with me if you would at the beginning of verse 5. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you ask me, Whither goest thou? But because I've said these things unto you, sorrow fill your heart. Nevertheless, I'll tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will prove the world's sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince 
of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things the Father hath are mine, and therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. May the Lord just bless you upon his word, and may be sanctified in our hearts. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, because the entrance of your word gives life. And we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us, that we might behold glorious, magnificent, and splendid truth from your law. You pray to your people's hearts, and prepare to receive with meekness your graphic words, they can save their souls. Pray to touch that person that's never come to faith in Christ. Maybe today their heart might be open and they might hear the gospel of the grace of God, how Christ died for their sins according to the scriptures, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures, how he sent it back to the right hand of God the Father, and how God will forgive them and grant them peace and joy unspeakable if they will only yield and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Speak, for your servants have ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to speak this morning from the subject, and when he is come, or better yet, just simply, when he is come. Several weeks ago, we uh, shared some thoughts from the subject of the comforter, speaking to the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And the minister of the Holy Spirit in the church, corporate, and the believers individually, is greatly misunderstood in our society today. There's a lot of discussion about the Holy Spirit, a lot of talk about the Holy Spirit, but unfortunately, very often it is not grounded in what the Bible has to say, what the Bible teaches. And so we can go off in many directions and we can go down many wrong paths if we are misguided or if we're led by our own thoughts, ideas, or our own imaginations of, about what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is all about. But the Lord Jesus Christ himself had something to say about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we saw in our last time we looked at this subject in John chapter 4, the very familiar passage of scripture that deals with the conversation Jesus had with the immoral woman at the well there in Samaria. And Jesus said to her that he could give her a living water that would spring up inside of her unto eternal life. And then in John chapter 7, verse 38, the Lord Jesus Christ says that, just look at that verse in John 7, 38, because I think it sheds a lot of light. It sets a context and a foundation for our thoughts this morning. In John chapter 7, verses 37, actually, through 39, it says, Now on the last day of the great feast, Jesus cried out, saying, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus speaks here in John 7, that those who would believe in him, he says, that from their innermost parts, would flow livers of river water, and then John gives a commentary by saying, this he spoke of the Holy Spirit, who was not yet given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. And so what John was saying, that the ministry of the Holy Spirit to indwell or live inside of the believers had not yet begun because the Holy Spirit would not come until after Jesus was glorified. And the glorification of Jesus was his death, burial, resurrection, and his ascension back to God the Father. And after ascending back to God the Father, Jesus promised his disciples that he would send them a comforter. Now look at John chapter 14, just by way of review for those who were not with us the last time we looked at this topic. 
In John chapter 14, that beloved chapter of the scripture that's often quoted by ministers like myself at funerals because it brings words of comfort to people who are lonely or people who are grieving who are going through difficulty. Jesus has told the disciples he was going to go, go away. We told them, let not their heart be troubled. If they believe in God, believe also in him, because in his father's house were many mansions. If it were not so, he would have told them he was going to prepare a place for them. And if he went away, he was going to come back and receive them unto himself. That where he was, there they would be also. And then in John chapter 6, 14, verse 16, Jesus says, and I will pray, the King James says, I will ask of the Father, and he will give you another comforter that he may be with you forever. So in John 14, 16, we have from Jesus himself the promise of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus describes the Holy Spirit as another comforter. In the Greek New Testament, the word that is used there for another, and the word comforter, the word for another, it means one just like me. Another one of the same kind, just like myself. In the word there for comforter, it speaks of a, a helper an advocate, one who calls alongside to help. So he promises, I will give you another one just like me, an alas parakletos, one that's just like me, just like me, of the same essence that I have. And so we believe this here in making that statement, Jesus himself infers that there is a trinity. In that one verse, he speaks of three different Persons. He speaks of himself praying. He speaks of the Father, the one he's going to pray to. And he spoke of the Holy Spirit, the one he's going to pray the Father would send. So there in one verse, you have Jesus referencing God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Not three gods, as the enemies of Christianity would try to suggest, but one God. One God eternally self-existing in three persons. And so we struggle with that. In our human minds, how can a God exist in three persons? The Bible does not try to explain it. Explain it. It merely teaches it as axiomatic truth. It is the truth that God exists as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God eternally exists in three distinct persons. So Jesus promises the Holy Spirit, but not only does he promise the Holy Spirit, he says the Holy Spirit's ministry will be in ministry with permanence. Look what he says. I will pray to the Father. He will give you another helper, another comforter, one just like me, that he will be with you forever. That he will abide with you forever. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit will be a ministry of permanence, a permanent ministry in our lives. We do not have to pray like David prayed in the Old Testament. When David prayed in Psalm 51, he prayed to God to take not the Holy Spirit from him. Because in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit did not come and permanently dwell inside of people. Instead, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon an individual. He would anoint them for service. He would empower them to do God's work. But he could remove himself if they refused or if they ceased to walk in the way of the Lord. But in the New Testament, his ministry is a ministry of permanently indwelling the believer. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. And so not only does he speak of the promise and the promise of the Holy Spirit, but the, the distinct person or the personality of the Holy Spirit. Verse 17. He refers to him as the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not know him, but you know him because he abides with you. And then he says, I will not leave you comfortless or as orphans, a better translation, I will come to you. After a little while, the world will behold me no more, but you will behold me because I live, ye shall live also. So he promised the Holy Spirit, he had a ministry of permanence, and he describes him as being a distinct person, the spirit of truth. But look at what he says about the Holy Spirit in verse 26. He says, but the comforter, the helper, when he comes, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. So the the purpose of the Holy Spirit, one of the purposes of his ministry is to teach us. John refers to him in 1 John 2.27 as the anointing that teaches us. It is the Holy Spirit that illuminates our hearts and minds where we can behold the truth of God and understand the truth of the Bible. I never cease to be amazed at 
people who get saved and all of a sudden they start saying, I'm reading the Bible and for the first time I now can understand it. It's starting to make sense. And as someone has said that it's much wiser than I, the reason the Bible is now making sense and the reason you can now understand it because now you're one of God's children. And the Bible is written with exclusivity. It's only written to the people of God and to the children of God. And so someone who is not a Christian trying to understand the Bible, they're reading a book that wasn't written to them or for them. And so it does appear to be foolishness, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But to the person who's received Christ, the Holy Spirit, the teacher, is now inside of them through the mysterious work of God, he now decodes the truth of God. And the word start makes sense. So the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, he teaches. And this morning, I'm grateful to the Lord, in verse 26, that he brings things to your remembrance. <laughs> but to remember something, you must have first have studied or entertained or thought about it or contemplated it. And so it does not excuse us as Christians from studying the Bible, from memorizing the scripture. As Paul says in the letter to Timothy, we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, work with it need not be ashamed, but rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. And so when we study the word and we memorize the word and meditate upon the word and when we apply the word in our lives, then we find ourselves in situations and circumstances and there are times when the Holy Spirit will bring things to our remembrance. He will bring to our remembrance when we need it to be there so that we can share the gospel. We can make a spiritual application. We can give people guidance into the scripture. So his purpose is to teach us and to bring things to our remembrance. Look at what else Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. Look at verse chapter 15. In chapter 15, verse 26, he says, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me. He will testify of me. So another minister of the Holy Spirit is to testify or to bear witness about the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we see what Jesus has to say about the minister of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, he teaches, he brings things to our remembrance, and he testifies of the Lord Jesus. That's his ministry. Because it's through the name of Jesus Christ that people are saved. And so, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. That when there is an overemphasis upon the Holy Spirit, an overemphasis upon the sensational and the theatrical, and where he obscures the Lord Jesus Christ as the only hope of salvation, then there is imbalance in the spiritual proclamation. Are you following? Mm -hmm. That when we are ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit, when we are discharging the truth in the power of the Holy Spirit, then the emphasis is upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Holy Spirit wants to talk about Jesus. Because he understands that neither is there salvation in any other. Because there's no other name under heaven given on men whereby we must be saved. The Holy Spirit understands that. He understands there's the one God and there's only one mediator between God and man. And that is the man, Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit understands that. He understands the greatest the mystery of godliness, the mysterion of God, this great mystery of God, this great sacred secret of God, that God was manifest in the flesh, in the person of Christ, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached only to the world, received back up into glory. The Holy Spirit wants to talk about Jesus. And he wants to present Jesus as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He wants to present Jesus as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the one that was dead, but he lives and lives forevermore. The Holy Spirit wants to talk about Jesus. He's not just interested in stirring people to an emotional fever or pitch, but if they're stirred, he wants them to be stirred because they're thinking and entertaining lofty thoughts about Jesus. And they now understand that it was Jesus who died on the cross and shed his blood that they might be forgiven of their sins. And the wretched souls could be saved. So the minister of the Holy Spirit is to testify. He bears witness. 
he gives incredible testimony of the power of Jesus Christ to save people's lives and to change people's lives. That's what Jesus says about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But look at what else Jesus says in chapter 16. Verse 7. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Now when Jesus was on the earth, he limited himself to space and to time. He limited himself to the number of people that he would meet and talk to and greet. But his desire was to have a personal relationship with everybody that believed in him. But in his humanity, he was limited into the number of people he could see and talk to and minister to in any given 24-hour day. So what Jesus was promising them, I'm going to go away, but when the Holy Spirit comes, he will not be limited by space. And so I will have a personal relationship with everybody who received me as their personal Savior. They all can know me and fellowship with me and experience my joy and my peace. So he's saying to the disciples, it's really to your advantage that I go away. Because if I go away, then I'm going to send the Holy Spirit back. And when the Holy Spirit comes back, he's not going to be limited in any way. And he will be able to empower my people wherever they might be. And to comfort my people wherever they might be. Remember in the Bible, the story of, uh, of Lazarus. And so Jesus was in Jerusalem, and Lazarus was in Bethany, and Lazarus died. And Mary and Martha were mourning there in Bethany because Jesus wasn't there. But now there isn't a single time that any believer loses a loved one, and you go into mourning, and you don't have to dispatch a messenger to go get Jesus, to come and see about you. Because before your loved one closes their eyes, and before they exhale the last breath, Jesus is already there in the person of the Holy Spirit to comfort you. And there's never a time that a tear falls from your eye that Jesus is not there to comfort you, and to console you, and to encourage you, and to remind you that you are his, and that he's yours, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so we have a personal relationship with God through the person of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of every believer. And this is not, it's not something for you to be afraid of. You see, we have had so much misrepresentation of the Holy Spirit. James Baldwin, that prolific African-American writer during the Holland Renaissance, talked about his spirit of the Holy Ghost. He said the last thing he wanted was the Holy Ghost. Because he saw people doing so many bizarre things, he did not want to engage in such bizarre activity. When the Holy Spirit comes, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, he doesn't remove your personality. He doesn't change your personality. But what he does, he comes in and he lifts your personality so that you can become the person that he intended for you to become. He enhances your personality. He fills your personality with his presence. So he doesn't want you trying to act like me because God knows there's only one of me that's needed for this world. And he doesn't want me to try to imitate you. And what he wants to do is he wants to work in and through your personality. Are you following me? When you read the Bible, something interesting. The Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 different men. And many of them were not contemporaries of each other. But when you read the writings of Paul, you can tell he's an educated person, a scholar, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin. Because he understands Judaism and the law in the Old Testament. When you read the writings of Luke... Luke and the Acts, you can tell that Luke was a meticulous person. Luke's got to give you some details. Why? Because Luke was a physician. He had a medical mind. And so Luke's mind was trained to give details. You read the writing of James and Peter, they were not formally educated in the Judaistic schools of learning, but they knew God and they talk about Jesus, but their, their, their words are not the weighty words of Paul. Yet they're all talking about the same God and the same Christ. And their words do not contradict, but they complement each other because God, the Holy Spirit, was moving on all the biblical writers, working through their personality, through their vocabulary, and through their experience to bring his word. So what are you saying, preacher? When he comes, the Holy Spirit, when he comes to take up residence inside of you, 
He wants to take you, the unique individual that he created, and he wants to fill your life the way a wind fills a sail. And he now wants to bear you along working through your personality, your experiences, and your framework to show that God has now taken up residence inside of you. And so if you're loud before you come to Christ, the Lord is not expecting you to become unloud. Just be sanctified and loud. Don't just be loud. <laughs> if you've got a sense of humor before you come to Christ, the Lord is not expecting you to become a stoic, a killjoy. Just have a sense of humor that is sanctified by the Holy Spirit and it builds and edifies and lifts people up because God must have a sense of humor. He must have a sense of humor to create us the way he created us. And to put, put up with us the way he put up with us. Like, Sometimes I have to laugh at me. Because I know God be laughing. And I say, Lord, I'm just going to join in with you. Because I know you just up there just having, just cracking up, laughing at me. And sometimes we take ourselves too seriously. We get too hung up. And we just need to allow the Lord to fill our lives. And Lord, you know me. You know my hangups. You know my dysfunction. You know all these crazy thoughts I have sometimes. And the idiosyncrasies that I have. And sometimes the attitudes I might You know all about that, but you love me anyhow. And you're salvaging something out of this ragtag life because you chose to come and live inside of me. And so when you understand that as a believer, as I shared with you before, then you stop apologizing for being who you are. You stop apologizing for being who you are. I am who I am and what I am, and I become who I am and what I am by the grace of God. That is, please God to leave me here, so I'm not going to apologize to the world. And neither should you. Holy Spirit wants to testify through you. Give me about seven more minutes, and I'll be through. Then in verse 7 and verse 8 of John 16, Jesus talks about the promise of the Holy Spirit in chapter 14, the permanence of the Holy Spirit, the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, and he continues that in John 17, this person and work of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, to teach us, to bring things to our remembrance, to testify about Jesus. Look at what else he says in verse 7. But I tell you the truth, if you advantage not go away, or if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you, and when he is come, when he is come, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer behold me, concerning judgment because the rule of this world has been judged. Let's stop right there. Jesus says when he is come, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world concerning sin or regarding sin. Now the word there that is used for convict is an interesting word. The King James says reprove. The same thing as convict, to, to confront. And it's a, a judicial term. In the court of law, the prosecuting attorney's job is to present the case against the defendant, to present the truth, to, con to present the facts, to convince the jury that this individual is guilty. And so Jesus says that in the lives of unbelievers, in the lives of unbelievers, the Holy Spirit becomes the prosecuting attorney. He presents the case. He presents the evidence that says, you, my brother, my son, you are a son. And he starts presenting the evidence and the case to, to us to convince us that we are sinners. So his ministry is to convict us, to persuade us, to realize that we are sinners because that's God's appraisal of us. That's God's evaluation of us that we have all sinned. Don't take it personal. You see, some, some people take it personal when, when the preachers say the Bible says that we've all sinned. And all means all. You just happen to be one of the all. We're all in this thing. We're all sinners. We've all missed the mark. We've all fallen short. We all come up wanting when we're weighed in the balances. For all have sin. And the Holy Spirit's job is to not let anybody off the hook. It is to convince everyone that they are a sinner, to stop every mouth. And then the burden rests with us. What do we do once convicted? 
What do we do once convicted? Do we walk away? Do we try to excuse or justify ourselves? Do we say, but I'm not nearly as bad as John Mitchell and Ben Tolliver? <laughs> Though the problem with that, you may not be any worse than John Mitchell and Ben Tolliver. But the only problem with that is that God doesn't evaluate on the curve. And so John Mitchell and Ben Tolliver are not the standard that God is evaluating whether or not he's going to let you into heaven or not. And praise God for that. <laughs> or Matthew J. Watts. The standard is Jesus. The righteous standard is the Lord Jesus Christ. And unless your righteousness exceeds that of John Mitchell, Ben Tolliver, and Glenn Walker, and yet your righteousness is that of Jesus, then God cannot and will not let you in heaven. And the only way we can get the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ is that we receive him as our personal Savior. Amen. And when we receive him, then God says, well, now I see them through the righteousness of Christ. I have deposited Christ's righteousness to their account. So now their account now has adequate funds that I can let them in. But the problem is, is that before we come to Christ, we're already overdrawn. As a matter of fact, before you're even born, you're overdrawn because you're born in sin, shape, and iniquity. We already have a deficit, deficient funds. Only can Christ get us out of the red and not only in the black, but get us over to where we have sufficient righteousness to gain access to heaven. The Holy Spirit's job is to convince us of that, to persuade us we need to be saved to persuade us to quit trying to justify and explain away our sin, to quit trying to believe that we are good enough when we get to heaven that God is going to say, well, you tried. No, that's not enough. It's not enough. You must come to Christ. So Jesus says he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness. And then he says concerning righteousness because I go to my Father and you no longer behold me. See, the whole issue during the life and ministry of Jesus was they said that he had a devil. They said that he was a false teacher. And so the proof as to whether or not he was who he claimed to be was that he do what he said he would do. And that was be buried and on the third day rise from the dead. So he says the Holy Spirit's ministry comes and he convinces people that Jesus is who he said he is and he has the righteousness he said he has because he convinces us that he indeed was raised from the dead. And of judgment, because the rule of this world has been judged. And that people might understand that there is a coming judgment. Now most people, if they be honest with themselves, believe that justice requires judgment. That if there is justice, if God is a God of justice, then God ought to judge the evil. God ought to judge the sin. God ought to judge the evil door. Would you not agree? But most people who are not Christian do not believe that God should judge them. He should judge evil and evil doers, but they never see themselves as one who is worthy of being judged. Jesus and the Holy Spirit will convince folk he will convince them of their own sin and of the righteousness of Christ, and he will convince them of the coming judgment and the fact that they deserve judgment. That's his word. To convince us of that. And so why would a person ever want to get saved if they didn't believe they were lost? Why would they ever want to get saved if they didn't believe the judgment was coming? And so the Holy Spirit convinces us of this judgment that is to come. Willie Allen's a wonderful minister. I wish I had time and I would talk a little bit longer. But his ministry today, in and through the believers, is to equip us to be credible witnesses that testify to the reality of the resurrected Christ. Let me look at one of the scriptures, and I promise this time I'll quit. Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul is talking about the fact that we're justified by our faith in the Lord Jesus. But he also talks about the role of the Holy Spirit 
in this process. Look at verse 9 of Romans 8. He says, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, I don't understand how the people who say you can be a Christian and not have the Holy Spirit. When Paul says that any man does not have the spirit, he's not a Christ. There's no such thing in this dispensation of grace as a Christian who doesn't have the Holy Spirit. There are Christians who don't live like they got the Holy Spirit, who don't act like they got the Holy Spirit, who don't talk like they got the Holy Spirit, but there's no such animal as a Christian who does not possess the Holy Spirit. He says, but if the Spirit of him, verse 11, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ, Jesus from the dead, will also give you, give life to your mortal bodies, through his spirit who indwells you. So the spirit of God gives life to us to live the Christian life. Amen. Verse 14, for all who have been led by the spirit, these are the sons of God. Verse 26, and in the same way, the spirit also helps our weaknesses. The spirit gives life, he helps our weaknesses, he helps our infirmity because we don't know how to pray we don't know when we should pray, and we don't know what to pray for at times. But the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. He says the Holy Spirit, he makes intercessions for us with utterings that cannot be expressed in words. Because he searches the heart, he who searches the heart knows the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to to the will of God. So what Paul is saying is that as believers, we are never alone. When he comes to fill our lives, to strengthen us, and to encourage us, when he comes to fill us so we can testify and bear witness to the reality of the resurrected Christ, when he comes and empower us to overcome habits and addictions and bad patterns of living to break the chains and the shackles and the bondage that sin has on our lives. When he comes, he comes and brings power to us. Amen. And when he comes, he comes and he brings a ministry of, of teaching and anointing to illuminate our hearts and minds that we can understand the things of the Lord. And he guides us and leads us into all truth. Amen. And he intercedes on behalf of us. Paul goes on to say something else. Paul says he bears witness with our spirit that we belong to God. And Paul says that the spirit, he cries out inside of us, Abba. And that was the most enduring term that a Jew could use to refer to the Father. The closest thing we have is this daddy. Abba, Father. And so he says the Holy Spirit is bearing witness with our spirit that we belong to God. And sometimes when you're going through things, and when you're facing the failures in your own life, and you're facing the shortcomings of your own life, and you start to second guess, and you start to wonder and question, am I a Christian at all? Do I know God at all? And Jesus said, and Paul said, but when you bow down before God, the spirit will cry and say, oh yeah, you know him. Yes, you know him. You're proud. I'm a father, daddy. You do know him, and he does know you, and he lives inside of you. Amen. So it's not something we should be afraid of. We must understand this ministry. We cannot live the Christian life by sure effort. It takes the enabling ministry of the Holy Spirit inside of us. Let's learn to yield to him and allow him to lead God and direct us. So if you're here this morning, Maybe you sense a tugging at your heart. And maybe for the first time in your life, or maybe in a more profound way than any other time in your life, you, you sense a great uneasiness, a need to get right with God. If you sense that, that's not because I'm so persuasive. It's because the Holy Spirit of the living God He's presented evidence to you. He's presented the truth to you that you need to change, that you need to be saved. That's the work of the Spirit. And if you sense a heaviness, the Spirit of the Lord is convicting you that you will feel this heaviness. And 
that you would cry, oh Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. If you're here today, I would plead with you, don't resist the Spirit's word. Don't resist it. Don't push him away. Because there may come a time when he ceases to strive with you. He ceases to bear on your spirit. He ceases to convict you of your sin. And he might allow you to go on and live a sinless life and go into Christless eternity. But today, today the Bible says today. Don't harden your heart today. Don't resist him today. Don't leave her today. If you sense he's calling you to salvation. Let us bow together. Every head bowed and every eye closed. All those who know the word of prayer.